Okay, guys, so let's look at that note quickly. If you're so busy sticking in, maybe just pause and then you can start sticking in again when we are done looking at it. I want to give you some time to work in class. <clears throat> um, okay, note. All right, finding an upper bound, the nearest neighbor algorithm. All right, so now we know how we fi find our lower bound, which is not always actually a proper route that we could follow, okay? But we at least know that we can't get a route that is shorter than that one. <clears throat> so they're saying here, because no known algorithm exists to find the best solution, we are just trying to find a very good solution. We call such a good solution an upper bound, meaning that the best solution must be less than or equal to our solution. All right, sometimes we can actually find one in between the lower and the upper bound, but often the upper bound will be the best solution that we, well, the good solution that we are going to use. You'll see in the example. Our aim is then to make this upper bound as small and as close to the lower bound as possible. All right, so they have a little visual representation here. So they say the length of the route, we have our lower bound, and this is based on yesterday's example, the one that you just stuck in on the A5 piece of paper. I think our lower bound there was 275. Then you can find an upper bound that's 324. All right, there are other solutions that would have a weight that's more than 324, but obviously we're not interested in those, okay? Because we're trying to find the, the shortest route or the cheapest or whatever is represented and then the base solution will be somewhere in between okay like we discussed already there isn't actually an algorithm to find the best solution so it might be impossible for you to find the best solution they do have where was this i saw somewhere yeah so there's on the next page if you just want to read through that little block there they say the shortest possible solution for a traveling salesman problem consisting of 15,112 German towns was found in 2001 using the cutting plane method. I don't know what that is, but this is just important. Oh, interesting. The computations were performed on 110 networked computers at Rice and Princeton universities. The total computation time was the same as 22.6 years on a single 500 megahertz processor all right so we obviously won't ever give you a question with fifteen thousand vertices all right so in real life so we in our very simplified examples can often actually find the best solution because there are so few to look at but in reality there isn't actually an algorithm yeah um, oh yeah probably hmm I haven't thought of that. Yeah, that's a possibility. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so the nearest neighbor algorithm. This is what we're going to use to find the upper bound. So you need to remember for the lower bound, we remove a vertex, then we do crystals or prims, and then we add the vertex in again. For upper bound, we're going to use the nearest neighbor algorithm. And guys, that algorithm is basically what the name says. Every time you're going to pick the vertex that is closest to the one that you've picked just before all right so they say step one let's actually just highlight that heading there nearest neighbor algorithm step one you're going to pick an arbitrary starting vertex they always tell you in the question which one to start with all right otherwise it will be a nightmare to mark so you will at least be given the one that you must start with Pick the edge of least weight that connects the current vertex to an as yet unvisited neighboring vertex. All right, so you start at vertex A, for example, and you're literally going to choose the shortest edge that is attached to vertex A. That will take you to the next vertex. All right, say it's B. Then from B, you're going to pick the edge that is shortest that will take you to a vertex that you have not yet visited, all right? So obviously you can't go back to A, but every time you have to go to an unvisited vertex, all right, following the shortest edge, basically. So then they say, once you add your first unvisited neighboring vertex, which they call V, they then say set V to being the current vertex. If all vertices have been visited, then stop, and then repeat from step two. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that, but okay, let's look at the, at the example. That's a bit confusing. 
All right, what they're saying there is the order in which the vertices are visited. We know that we have to write that down always. That is the root of the upper bound. Okay, just like we did for the lower bound, we wrote the order of the vertices down, or the edges actually. They say the nearest neighbor algorithm is easy to apply, executes quickly on a computer, and is normally fairly close, on average 10 to 15% above the optimal route. However, there are examples for which it gives the worst possible route. Okay, that's not nice, but we'll, that probably won't happen to us. Hasn't happened in any example that I've done before. Um, in, so this is what I was saying earlier. In smaller graphs, human insight can often improve the result of the nearest neighbor algorithm. And so the solution should be checked before use. Okay, so that's what I was saying. Because we are gonna be working with relatively small graphs, we can often actually find the best route by inspection, okay. So example one, we're looking at the same graph from yesterday, all right, where E is the office. So using the example of Jacob as before, we are going to determine an upper bound for the shortest round trip route that visits each store exactly once and then returns to the office. We remember that the lower bound was 275. Okay, so we are expecting to get a value that's bigger than 275. So now they'll tell you which vertex to start with. Or in this case, it's quite obvious that because E is his office and that's where he has to start, that would be your starting vertex. Okay, so you would just have to read the question properly, the scenario, but yeah, E will be the starting vertex. Now guys, from E, we need to go to the nearest unvisited neighboring vertex. All right, so that would either be F or B or D. Now, which one is closest? Which one has the least weight on the edge leading to that vertex? F, all right? So that is the first one that we're going to choose. You can color that in with your highlighter or with your pen or whatever. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, yes. Can I just put this in? I feel I'm losing my mind today. Like I put things down and I don't, can't remember where I put them then. Oh, it's a mess. Okay, here. Oh, it's been a long week. Okay, here's the second one. We have this one. Okay, this other one is one more. Yeah, and then there is one more, which I might be. I'm writing on it. Can I? <laughs> and then I'll give it to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so we find with EF, and then that is obviously what you'll write down. Okay, EF, and then in brackets 50. Now, from F, we now need to go to the nearest unvisited neighboring vertex. So we have 75, 60, or another 75. Obviously, it's going to be 60, all right? They do show it step by step underneath, but you can also just fill it in on the top one. So now we're at B. Now we need to go to the nearest unvisited neighboring vertex. And I think we all can see that that will be A, right? If we follow the 35. Okay, next one would be to go to C. All right, now we actually only have two options to choose from. It's 75 or 55, so it would have to be C. And guys, as you are filling them in, you're writing them down as well, okay? Because that's what they're going to mark. Now, next up. Now, we can't go back to B because that is not an unvisited neighboring vertex. Okay, it has to be a vertex that you have not gone to yet. So that would be to go to D. And then from there... We're going to have to go down to E, hey? Let me just check here. Have we done all the steps that they've listed here? I'm just checking D. And then, oh, I think it's now on the next page they have that last step. So just check on the second page. Yeah, there they have it. They've written it down. All right, so there they say that would be the last step. So when we add D and then returning to the office E completes the route. Okay, so you would go down to E, yes. Can we have these other ones where if we were um, at C, for example, mm -hmm. and we have to get to B, but we need to be 
the distance from B, C to B to D would be less than C to B, and then we would sorry, that much. So that is again when you're now finding the actual route after finding your upper bound. So finding your upper bound has to follow these steps, and then the, the correct route or the better route might be one of those. Yeah. Okay, are we fine there, guys? So that would be the upper bound. So you would add all of those together. It is done on the Sorry, I'm confused now. On the second page. Okay, cool. You can come fetch this page. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, okay, are we fine then? Now, guys, what they say here at the bottom now is the route that has been created is actually a Hamiltonian circuit of minimum weight. All right. So in this case, the best route for this graph is actually the upper bound. Okay, so now if there was a, a third part to this question where they say, okay, now you found the lower bound, which was 275, you found the upper bound, which is 305, now find the best route. Okay, now you would try and look. What I suggest is first check whether your upper bound is in fact the best route. Okay, I'm just gonna fill it in again here because it's on the other page. What was it? E to F to B to A, to C, to D, to E. Now guys, that's quite a nice direct route of getting to all of the vertices without actually visiting any of them more than once, right? Because remember Hamiltonian circuit is where you're only visiting them once anyway. You're not gonna go to a shop that you've already been to before, okay. <clears throat> so let's just highlight there. <clears throat> The route that has been created is actually a Hamiltonian circuit of minimum weight. All right, there's another example that I want us to look at quickly. Example two here at the bottom. There's a lot of waffle there in between that we're not going to read into right now. Okay, we might discuss some of it later on. Okay, so for example two, the graph shows a number of hostels in a national park and the possible paths joining them. The numbers on the edges give the lengths in kilometers of the paths. Starting at N, all right, so that is where we're starting. Determine the upper bound of a round trip to every hostel and back to N using the nearest neighbor algorithm. Right now, sometimes they might not say that you have to use the nearest neighbor algorithm. You actually have to know that. Okay, so let's do that together, guys. We're starting at N. Which one is the shortest one connected to N? M, all right? So we're gonna do NM. So let's write that in as well. NM, which is three plus. Now from M, I need to go to the nearest unvisited vertex, neighboring vertex, which would be P. So M, P, which is four, Plus, from P, I now need to go to the nearest unvisited neighboring vertex. Yeah, let's do O. So what is that? P-O, which is seven. Oh no. <clears throat> what do we do now? Now, let's just quickly see what they have here. They have a little discussion on the next page. All right. They say, in some traveling salesman problems, it is beneficial to draw in a complete network showing the shortest distance between any two vertices. That is, every vertex is joined to every other vertex. Because in this case, we don't have a complete graph, right? If we actually look at the graph that they gave us, O is not connected to Q, for example, all right? In, well, it is kind of indirectly, all right? But not directly. So that is what they've done. So just using a dotted line, you can use a pencil or whatever, so that we don't, in reality, we would be going past the same vertex, all right? But just so that it kind of looks like we're not. <laughs> we're drawing in OQ. Now, guys, now we need to look at the edges that we actually have. And we need to figure out what would the shortest way of going. We're going to have to use multiple edges to get to Q from O. 
But what would the shortest route be? We can go via P, right? Which I know we've already visited P, but we, there's no way around it in this case. So that would be seven and then 10. So that would be 17. But what if we go via M? Seven and 13, that's gonna be 20. Right now, what is a shorter route, 17 or 20? 17. Okay, so that is the one that we fill in. Okay, and then that is the one that we are actually going to follow. I'm just waiting for my ink to dry, but you can indicate that one so long. We're going to then do OQ, which is 17. Right, and then once we add Q, we have now actually visited all of the vertices, right? Once we get to Q, but we do need to go back to N. So now what would the shortest route be to go back to N? Would it be 13 at the bottom here? Or would it be 13 plus four there at the top? It would be 13, all right. So that would be our last. I'm gonna fill that in just now. I just don't want it to smudge. Oh, that looks terrible plus QN, which is then 13. Okay, and we can then find that or add all of those values together. And then we do get 44 kilometers, it says here. Is it 44 if we add them? 14, right, is it, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so that would be your upper bound, guys. Let's see if I can put this in now without it smudging. Okay, yes. <laughs> All right, guys, now for number two, they're saying by inspection, a shorter route than the upper bound. Now, remember what we're actually trying to find here, a Hamiltonian circuit. So we're wanting to not visit the same vertex twice, all right, unless we have absolutely no way around it, like we had to do in this one. See if you can do that, guys. This is almost like a question that you would have gotten in grade 10, where you have to find a Hamiltonian circuit, but now you need to find one that is shorter than 44 kilometers. See if you can do that on your own, please. Mm -hmm. If it's shorter than another option, yeah. Yeah, it does, but it's just because in this case, the type of graph that they've given us, that would be the only way of actually visiting all the vertices. See, there's no way around it. Yeah, that's why we, we jippo the system actually by filling in that dotted line so that it technically is a Hamiltonian circuit, but actually it's not. Yeah. Now guys, please note that in the question, they're not saying the shortest route. They're just saying a shorter route than the upper bound, right? 
So if you find one that's shorter than 44, you don't have to sit for hours and hours and try to find one that's still smaller or shorter than the one that you found. Okay, so the one that they've suggested in this on this note here is by going in to P to Q and then technically doing that, but to make it look like a Hamiltonian circuit, we're going to use our dotted line, right? And then to M and then back to N like that. So that gives you a root of 42, they're saying, right? 5 plus 10 is 15, plus 17 is 22, plus 7 plus 3, that gives you 42, right? So that's a 22, 32 actually, sorry, plus 10 is 42. Yes. Okay. Like this. M, but remember. Okay. N, sorry, I just copied what the book was doing. Okay. N, M. M, P. Sorry, M, O. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Q, and then. Okay, nice. And that's 40. Okay, great. Right, so that is trial and error, guys. So it is basically like the ones that you did in grade 10 where you just had to find a root, but now it's a bit more difficult because you have to find the shortest root that you can find. But we at least know that it has to be smaller than 44. All right. And if, I'll be with you now, Lauren, if the question is worded like this and it just says a shorter root, then even the one of 42 would have gotten you the marks. All right. Is that your question? No. Mm -hmm. If um, it's writing it out so like, as an answer, OQ isn't an actual line, so we have to write OQ in the Q. So I would just write OPQ, like the three letters oh, next okay, to each yeah. other, like that. Mm -hmm. That's what they do in the answer series, yeah. Okay, are you guys ready to practice some of these on your own? Okay, so from this textbook, which I'm still not sure if you all have this book, the elective one. There is a box here, so if you don't have it, please come fetch one quickly. So this is exercise. It's the same one still. Exercise. Um, 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 um. Was it six point one or what was it? Exercise GT six point one. <laughs> So I don't like the fact that these books open like this and not like a normal book, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not great. I wish they would just change it. Okay, guys, um, no, we're not doing number one. You've already done two, hey? Two we already did. That was Kruskal and Prims. All right, I want you to do number three. I didn't even get to the thing three, but it's this one there, number three. Number three, all right. So they give you the graph there, but then on the next part, they have the actual questions. So they say a student has sought to determine a minimum spanning tree using crystals. The ages he has chosen are recorded in order. Identify and briefly explain two mistakes he has made. All right, hence correctly design a spanning tree of minimum weight based on Prim's algorithm and starting at vertex C. Okay, so using cruise skulls, what did he do wrong here and why? And then you need to use prims, prims to um, find a proper one, a correct one. For A, you've already done, we found the lower bound. All right, that was homework for today. I want you to do for B and C. Okay, so A, you already have the lower bound, which was, 605, just in case you've forgotten. 605 units, that was the lower bound. So the upper bound is obviously going to be more than 605. And then you're going to find your good root between 605 and whatever the upper bound is. And the upper bound might be the good root. Okay, you're going to have to check that. Then we have number five. Um, yeah, let's do number five. Right, there's some revision there as well. We can take a look at that first question. <clears throat> and then number seven. I will write this all down as well, but if you have the book, you can just note it in here. 
Then guys, what's quite nice is that on the next page, they have grade 12 graph theory exam questions. Now we must still do one last section for graph theory. So that's obviously not including this, but these are quite nice questions. Just, this is exactly what I was talking about yesterday where I said that you need to know, you need to be able to read a question and understand which algorithm you need to use for it. Okay, so I'm not gonna save any of this for homework, but these, exam questions are quite nice for when you actually study, all right? Because the guy that wrote this book, um, Paul Fury, he has apparently moved to New Zealand, but he used to take all the exams. He used to take all the paper to the graph theory and matrices exams. And I'm pretty sure he probably already has taken this year's one as well, all right? Or they're gonna model it according to all the previous year's ones. You know, they always have like the same, kind of layout. So it's based on his questions and he wrote this textbook, which is why I've been saying we must not do what he's been doing. Because <laughs> he obviously knows what's going on in this stuff. Right, but these are nice questions to practice maybe later on when you have time. And you can see there are lots of questions here. There's number four, there's number five. And this is actually um, covering all grade 10, 11 and 12 stuff that you've done. Okay, so not only matrix stuff. So even here, is this a regular graph? Give a reason for your answer. It is clear that an Eulerian circuit does not exist in the graph, blah, blah, blah. All right, so it's nice revision for your mocks and then for your finals. On Monday, we are going to do the last section. Oh, it even goes to question 10. All right, so there's nine and there's question 10. This is what we are doing on Monday. And this is actually where we are putting graphs and matrices together. <laughs> <laughs> So no, it's not, we're not gonna do like matrix calculations with them. It's just putting a graph into a matrix and putting a matrix into a graph, just like moving in between the two of them. So we'll do this on Monday. I know we must still do matrices, but we don't need that stuff for these types of questions. So yeah, that is the last section on graph theory. And your test on Wednesday next week, your core test, you will not be writing in the afternoon anymore. We've moved that test to the morning, right? Because I know there was some yeah, unhappiness about it being in the afternoon, but I'm still gonna have to teach you guys in the afternoon. Okay, please, we're gonna be doing AP, so it is important. And that test does not include finance, right? It's just on similarity proportion, that stuff, and then probability. Okay, and it's only only the grade 12 probability that it's on. It's not the old stuff. Okay, let me just quickly write down which ones you're supposed to be doing now for Monday. It's exercise GT 6.1. On page, what is it? GT 26. And I said number three. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is MAT. You may just be here. Three, four, B, and C. Yeah. Five and seven. Thank you, Sophie. All right. Those are the ones that you're doing, guys. If you don't have this book, come fetch the also load in the box. All right. You might have to open the plastic. Can I borrow one for space? Uh, oh, maybe rather just <laughs> put the work over the picture. I've already had nightmares of, of you guys having to hand these books in and not knowing if you actually have the books or not. And I never took off my lips. So it is my own fault. It's not. It's not. <laughs> okay, guys, get going, please. And this is seven in that last lesson, like the meaning. Well, this is Penny. Oh, yay. That was fun. You know what I like when it's substitution? Absolute silence, right? <laughs> I'll give you the same Please. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give up my dream, so you guys need to be quiet. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Um, I'm just going to go on what I know from experience, and you are talking now. <laughs> but you can prove it to me. You can prove it to me in theory and mind. I'll that. Thank you. Okay, guys, get going. It's quite a lot of work, but you still have 20 minutes, 18.